Good morning, church. Let's try that again. Good morning, church. What a great day it is to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. So good to see each and every one of you here with us today. And if you are a guest here in person or even on our live stream, we just want to welcome you and, and thank you for coming and joining us this Sunday morning. Uh, in the bulletin, we do have our connection card. And if you would pl do, uh, please take a moment to fill this out. You can put it in the offering uh, plate after you're done. But we would love to just get to know you, to follow up with you. If you have any prayer needs, please let us know on the bottom of the connection card how we can be praying for you. Uh, if you are on our live stream and a guest, you can go to our church website, which is dwmbc.org, and you can fill out a connection card on our church website. And we just want to thank you for joining us. Excuse me real quick. Uh, a few other things to note in our bulletins this morning, if you would take a look. We, I know we have a lot of upcoming um, ministry opportunities. Um, first, tonight we have the Christmas cantata. Who's excited for the Christmas cantata? Woo! All right. So I know they've been working hard, and we're so excited to come tonight. Uh, it's not in the bulletin, but there is going to be a prayer walk at 5 o'clock here in the sanctuary. So come and join us for a time of prayer before the cantata starts at 6 o'clock. Um, and then after that, we'll be heading over to the Family Life Center, uh, following the cantata to have some refreshments. So come and join us tonight for the Christmas cantata. Um, second, we do have our grocery ministry tomorrow. Uh, we are in need of volunteers. We've been very short-handed the last few times. We've gone out. If you're able to come and help us, we're meeting at 9 o'clock tomorrow in the front of Brookshire Brothers to pray together before getting started. Uh, if you're new to the grocery ministry, you're not sure where you're going, uh, we can make sure to get you teamed up with somebody who uh, knows the route. So if you have any questions about grocery ministry, please let me know. But again, we're meeting tomorrow at 9 o'clock over at the front of Brookshire Brothers. We do have our uh, Christmas open house for the church office, and that's going to be this Tuesday, December 13th from 11 a.m. to 1 o'clock. There will be lots of snacks and appetizers, and it will just be a good time of fellowship. Come and join us this Tuesday for that. Uh, we do have our annual Christmas baskets that are happening this Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Uh, we are in need of a lot of volunteers. We meet over at the gymnasium at the Family Life Center, so uh, Wednesday, December 14th from 8 to 11 a.m., um, and then also we'll need Thursday uh, from 9 a.m. to noon and Friday, um, starting at 8 a.m., going till noon. Um, you can just show up and we'll put you to work. But I know Kevin and Teresa are heading that up. If you have any questions, you can talk to them or contact the church office. But please come join us Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday for Christmas baskets. Um, not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, the 21st, we're going to be doing our church-wide Christmas caroling for the adults, youth, and children. We'll meet over at the Family Live Center. And don't forget to mark your calendars. We have our Christmas Eve candlelight service here at 5.30 p.m. And then Christmas Day, as you know, it lands on a Sunday. It's going to be just a casual day. Come and join us at 10 a.m. There'll be no Sunday school that day, but come and join us with your family and your friends, okay? Again, a joy to be here with you this morning. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for just an, another day, Lord, that we can be together in your house. Lord, I thank you for all these who are here um, this morning. I pray for those who are away. I know many are still struggling, just battling illnesses and health issues, Lord. We pray for them. We ask for your healing power upon them, that you would bring them back safely to us. Lord, I thank you for this time that we have now to come before you, Lord, to worship you, Lord, as your church in song and praise and through the studying of your holy word. And I just pray you be with Brother Ethan, the band, the choir, as they lead us in song and praise. And Lord, I thank you for bringing uh, Pastor Greg back safely to us. And I just pray, Lord, that you be with him as he speaks your word to us this day, that you would just move in this place, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would touch our hearts, that you would challenge and encourage and change us, dear Father, to be more like you. Lord, I pray that we would not just hear your word, but we'd be obedient and living for you each and every day. We again just love you. We thank you for this time together, and we just commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, church. Let's go ahead and stand together and sing Tis So Sweet. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, 
don't know when he counts not this up thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more stronger than darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more what patience what patience would wait as we constantly what Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the farthest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What riches? What riches of kindness He lavished on us. His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood beneath the dead we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many. His mercy We come to you today, God, just to thank you so much. Lord, that your mercy is more than any sin that we could ever have. God, your mercy is so much more than anything that goes on in this world. God, so I pray that today we would look upon the cross. God, we would look upon the blood that was shed. God, I pray that, Lord, we would see just how awesome and how incredible you really are. So, Lord, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. We don't see points on a map. They aren't just places to us. We see stories of lives living without the hope found in Jesus. Today, Somewhere between the Great Commission and the Great Multitude, we find ourselves facing the world's greatest problem, lostness. Even in the midst of natural disasters, humanitarian crises, and political instability, Southern Baptists send IMB missionaries to give their lives to the lost, living amongst those who have never heard the gospel. People in hard to reach places, people in cities, and those who are dispersed and displaced around the world. At the IMB, we believe that missionary presence cultivates gospel access. Gospel access that knows no geographic or social boundary. We believe that missionary presence fuels gospel belief. And we see the results. We see lives transformed, generations forever changed, and churches planted. 
local expressions of the church that take ownership and thrive. God has made our purpose clear. Together, we seek to take the gospel to every nation, to all tribes, to all peoples, to all languages. We don't see places on a map. We see our place in fulfilling the Great Commission. This is our mission. This is your mission. And we are reaching the nations together. to sleeve thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home was there found no room for thy holy nativity.
Let us pray. Lord, thank you for another beautiful day you've given us to come and worship you in your house, Lord. Lord, we just ask that you be with those that are not here with us, whether it be for sickness or travels, Lord, whatever, just bring them back to us safely. Lord, we thank you for the choir and Brother Ethan and the band. Just be with them tonight as they present us a cantata. Lord, we just pray that their voices and the music and everything just go smoothly and that you alone are worshipped. Lord, we just ask that you bless this offering, use it to the furtherance of your kingdom. Lord, we love you and we thank you and forgive us where we fail you. It's your son's name we pray. Amen. We have children who would like to go to children's church. You can go to the back. Miss Jeanette is ready for you. The rest of you guys, open your Bibles. We're looking at Nehemiah chapter 8 today. I had an interesting, I think a really good question right before the service today. And it is, what is a cantata? And I, and I realized something, if you're not brought up musically, you, you may not know the answer to that. Well, the cantata, in case you're wondering what we're doing tonight, a little bit of what we just did with the choir. They have probably seven or eight pieces about Christmas that are, they've been working on since September, and they will share it along with some narration. It'll be a very beautiful Christmas celebration as we celebrate the birth of Christ. So come back tonight, 6 o'clock. I know that you will enjoy that music. Have you got your spots in the Bible? 
Nehemiah, or your spot. Nehemiah chapter 8, if you have it and you're able, stand with me. We're going to read three portions of the chapter together, beginning in verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Now go to verse 5. And Ezra opened a book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. Hence, we are standing. Here's an example in Scripture for standing in reverence for the reading of God's Word. Because that's another question. Why do we stand while we read God's Word? That is is why. Verse 6. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Verse 8, they read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our God, to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Let's pray together. Lord, we are grateful for your word. We thank you for this day that you blessed us with to to gather together for worship, lifting our voices in song and praise to you. Lord, and hearing a Christmas message through music from the choir, and now, Lord, studying your word. We pray that your spirit would move in this congregation, in this midst, midst, that you would convict us, that you would challenge us to your works, and that we would each grow this day closer to you, desiring to serve you well in all that you call us to do. Lord, I pray your blessing on this day. Please speak through me and open ears to hear. In Jesus' name we pray together and God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So the wall has now been completed and the leadership within Jerusalem has been established in, in that city. It's all put into place. Now you may, if you're paying close attention, wonder why we skipped chapter 7. Well, we kind of glossed over it, but let me tell you a little bit about what you would read in chapter 7. It's a detailed record of those who had come from captivity to live in Jerusalem, more of a genealogy type chapter. So you can go back and look at it, but there are some things there that will be important to us. Once the physical details had been put in place surrounding, you know, surrounding the wall, the people began to realize something is missing. So the wall is in place, they're all there, and they begin to think something is missing. And Nehemiah in chapter 8 shares his thoughts and, and the thoughts that come to mind, I hope as you have from Nehemiah, and hope you got it as we read, they wanted spiritual nourishment. That was the something that was missing, being spiritually fed. They were reaching out for, really, spiritual revival. Now that's an interesting thing. We talk about revival, and you may hear the comment, we need revival because we need to get the lost saved in our community. Well, I would tell you, that's, that's partially correct. But revival is truly for the saved already, for those who walk with the Lord, but may have wandered away, may have just slid back a little bit. Revival is to challenge the hearts of the saved to do what? 
to get excited about God, so they go out and tell those who don't know about God how to know God. And so in that sense, revival is for the saved and the unsaved. And so Nehemiah is looking looking upon this group, and he knows that something has to be done. And I will tell you this, we have walked through the book of Nehemiah, and Nehemiah bowed to the plans of God. The plan of God was to build this wall. Today what we will see is that there was even a greater plan in God's mind for the people of Jerusalem. Nehemiah does not neglect it. And that's what, that's what we will see as we continue to go. There's a man by the name of General William Booth. Who knows General, who knew or knows of General William Booth? Probably most of you here. A perfect time to mention General William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. He was converted in a Methodist church in Nottingham. And each year, each year hundreds of people, maybe even thousands, come to that church to visit and see where, where he came to know the Lord. On one of the walls in the church, there is a, a bit of a plaque or tablet there commemorating the fact that, that Booth was saved in this church. One day, an older man stepped into the church and he stood by that tablet which commemorates Booth's conversion. And the minister approaches. And the old man says to the minister, can men say their prayers here? And the minister said, of course, a man can say his prayers here. And the old man knelt, bowed his head. He raised his eyes toward the tablet. And and they were full of reverence. And he quietly said this, Oh God, do it again do it again. Well, what was he praying for? He was praying for a revival among men who just like Booth had had touched many people, would also touch many people. And I think that was the prayer in Jerusalem, the hearts. We need something spiritual. They were saying, God, do it again. And that's exactly what we need. We need men and women to pray and say, God, work here. God, do a work here once again. Won't you pray that? Won't we, can't we pray that together? Well, I mentioned about revival. And this is probably the first recorded revival in Scripture. In verse 1, we see something interesting happen. All the people have come together. They gathered. And then something very exciting takes place. They, they call out. The people tell Ezra, bring out the book of the law of Moses. They wanted the Word of God that they had to be shared. They were hungry for it. And they were hungry to hear how God wanted their hearts, their lives to be shaped. According to chapter 7, this is going, of course, back to the chapter that we, we, we jumped over. The people were now well-ordered. There was government there. So things were going very well that way. There were jobs. There was protection by the wall. That was important. But something was missing. And I want you to think about this. We, the reason I'm even preaching about Nehemiah was because of this project that we're going through. We need work on our building. And, and, and the day will come when our walls are all great looking. Everything has been restored. And, and, and that's a wonderful thing to think about. But there's something even then that will be even more important. And you look at Jerusalem, the walls have now been rebuilt. They've been repaired. And the people are realizing there's something more important in the wall. And it was our spiritual development. And that's what it will always be for God's church. No matter how, we'll get to God's building here looking great and all restored, but there's something even greater. People needing to come to Jesus and grow in that faith. I once read, well, let me say this. I, I think this will help tie what I just said together. It's not enough to have a wonderful exterior if there's no life inside. And you are the life. You are God's people that will go out from what is. A, it's, it's already a beautiful place. It'll only get more and more beautiful. But we got to go out. I once read of an impressive piece of machinery. It had hundreds of wheels, cogs, and pulleys, and belts, and lights. They all moved or lit up with the touch of a button. And someone finally asked the inventor, what does your machinery do? And he said, oh, It doesn't do anything, but doesn't it run beautifully? (laughs) And I I just want you to grab on to that picture. Many churches are quite impressive to look at, but there's really nothing inside. Buildings and programs alone are not enough. So revival was taking place. What was needed? 
There was something more than strong walls around Jerusalem needed here. Ian Bounds, a great preacher, once said, what the church needs today is not more machinery or better, and not new organizations or more and novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. The Holy Ghost does not flow through methods, but through men and women. He does not come on machinery, but on men and women. He does not anoint plans, but He anoints men. Men of prayer. Men of prayer. That's, where, that's revival needing to take place. And it was going on. The walls were built to offer security to the people of Jerusalem, but also to set God's people apart from the others of the land. They were to be unique. Unique in that they were God's people. Unique in the God that they worshipped the one true and living God. Now, Nehemiah had to make sure, and these walls are in place, he had to make sure that they were put to proper use, and which he did. And he did several things. First of, first, of, first of which is this. He got the right person into the right job. Who am I, who am I talking about? As you read through Ezra. So Nehemiah recognized that something was needed for the people to hear the voice of God. Ezra became God's spokesperson to the people. Nehemiah put him right in place. Ezra could do, and, and this is the realization that Nehemiah made, Ezra could do a better job at that than Nehemiah could do. And that's a great picture for us. We've talked so much about the leadership of, of Nehemiah, and here again, he is getting someone into the position to do a job that he might could have done, but he wouldn't have done it as well as Nehemiah did. So that's the first thing. He got the right person into the right job. Second, he made sure that truth was established within the community. The scripture was openly preached to the people. We read that as we begin reading this chapter. It's openly preached. Now, back three or four weeks ago, I talked to you about Nehemiah coming and he said, Brian, build the wall. Ethan, build the wall. Ed, build the wall. Work for the people beside you. Work for your family. Work for those you love. Build this wall. And in a way, and if you remember that day, I compared it to a coach of any sport coming and speaking to his team right before they go out to, to play the game. Fight for your brothers. Fight. Go out there on the field and win this day. Well, Nehemiah had done that, but that is an emotional response. That is an emotional connection that he made with the people to, to help them to go forward. An emotion can carry you a part of the way. Amen. A part of the way. But something more is needed. And that is what, 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 is, what Nehemiah was recognizing. That, that emotions carry you part of the way, but ultimately, everything we do must be established by truth. That is why the Word of God is so important. It is the truth given to us for our benefit, but also to share with others. The first steps then... And sharing that truth, it, it will lead to revival, but there's some steps that must take place. So let's walk through what happened. First, we see the reading of God's Word in verses 1 through 3. That's where exposition begins. You know what I mean by that? I, I will e expound to you the Scriptures, but it's got to begin with the reading of the Scriptures. Just the read. If I stood here each week and just read to you God's Word, what does the Bible tell us? The Word of God is living and it is active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it penetrates into us. So the work of God does the work. This book, when read, will expand upon each other, itself and you can look in other sections to help explain it. It's very important to see. Now, I think even right, as, as we're speaking, this may help you to see what I'm trying to say. In Romans chapter 10, there is comment asking, uh, talking about the spread of the gospel. And it's that, that passage that says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. What are they talking about? People proclaiming the gospel. But it says, how can a man hear, or how can a man understand, unless it's first been preached or taken? And so that is what's important here. Lifting up the Word of God in the day of Nehemiah, in our day as well. So we see that exposition begins with the reading of the Word. And I'll tell you one more thing, not with the opinion of man. Because my, my opinion, I, I pray that it is always godly, that I do not lead you astray in any way, but the Bible expounds upon itself. 
And, and that is what's so important for us to see. So we see God's word being read. We also see in this passage respect for the truth and that the people were listening attentively. At the end of verse 3, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. They wanted to hear what was being shared with them. Verse 5, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. They stood up because they were excited. They stood up again in reverence to God. Verse 6, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They were hearing the word of God. They said, Amen, we believe. You know what that means? So be it. So be it. And that's what they were shouting out because they were attentive and interested in hearing what God had to say, say, with, say to them. So the word of God is shared. We see respect for it. Third, we see the truth being explained. Look in verse 8. They read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense. You know what that means? They explain what the passage meant. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. Now, these are God's people. Why did they need the Scripture to be explained to them? I want you to think about that for a minute. You probably already know the answer. We have to remember that these people were Jews by birth, but they were not Jews by tongue or by culture. What do I mean by that? They had been in captivity for years away from their tongue, away from their culture. And so now these Jews who had come from Babylon brought with them that mentality, that lifestyle. They were hearing a Hebrew Bible, but they were listening through Babylonian ears. And so they needed to have it explained. The explanation of the Scripture made it all clear to them. Does that even make sense? Why do we need churches? Why do we need preachers? Why do we need missionaries? Because the world hears the Word of God through worldly ears. And, and we need pastors, again, teachers, preachers, to share the Word of God so that all can understand. And that's an example right here for us. So, Nehemiah has done several things, but he set up the Word of God to be preached. He, the people were there in attention. And, and then we, we see the truth explained to them. But also as they're moving toward a revival, there's one more thing. We see application. In verse 9, what do we read? Nehemiah, who was a governor, and Ezra the priest, and a scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Why were they weeping? They, they, they said, okay. So Ezra's reading. And you know what he's reading about? Their sin. Their sin. Their wrongdoing. And they hear these words and they take it to heart and they begin to weep because they know what they deserve. The wages of sin is death. Death. And we've got this coming upon us. So they begin to weep. But the good news came that day to them. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But they were weeping because of that. And, and it, it was pointed out to them, don't weep. This is a day of rejoicing. This is a day of rejoicing. Well, what made them weep? It was the depth of of their conviction. Conviction hit them. They, they brought a weeping. Now, just briefly, conviction is from the Spirit of God. Conviction, it touches our hearts, maybe it even tugs at our hearts, calling us to God. If you don't know Jesus personally, and you're listening to a message about Jesus, and your heart's kind of pounding out your chest, that's, that's maybe God just saying, you need to respond. But there are times when we are walking with the Lord in a sense, but have maybe stumbled away, and you still get that, tum that, that tugging, that's conviction of the Lord. Say, okay, this is your chance. Come back to the Lord. Serve me. Come back. Now, it's different from guilt, because I could stand here as a man and lay guilt upon you. I could do that, and, and we do it to each other. But I will tell you, if I'm laying guilt upon you, I'm not serving the Lord. If I am preaching and you are convicted, I'm serving the Lord. Why do I say that? Guilt's from the devil. Guilt is from the devil, and, and it, 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 it doesn't lead to a good end because we're motivated not to do what God wants us to do, but to get out of guilt. And there's a difference. In conviction, we are moved because of our heart and love for the Lord moves us to, to, to act. Conviction is what God uses 
to bring people to him. This was not a day to mourn. We see that in verses 10 and 11. It was a day to celebrate God's forgiveness. Do not be grieved for the what? The joy of the Lord is your strength. What is the joy? But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's what these priests were pointing out. Yes, you were in sin. You were weeping. You were mourning. Cut it out. Receive the forgiveness that God wants to offer you. And the people realized that God had received them with open arms and they were rejoicing. We see that in verse 12. Revival had swept across the people. Nehemiah, I think, is an outstanding person. He's very wise. What did he do in all this? He got out of the way. He let it happen. Too many times we say, oh, what what can we do? There's revival taking place or a movement among us. What What do we try to do? Well, we try to steer it. We try to place it into the box that we think it should fit in instead of just letting it happen. Let God work. Years ago, I heard an ESPN, on ESPN a comment about one of the more successful football coaches of that year. It was a first-year coach for the Boston College Eagles football team. And they called him Coach Jag. He's Coach Jeff Jagodzinski. I actually need Lynn here to do this pronunciation for me. He could probably give it to me correctly. But they called him Jeff. They, needless to say, because of that, they called him Jeff Jag. Well, he was being interviewed, and the team had been very successful. It was kind of like a a ribbing that he was taking from one of the commentators. The commentator said this, you inherit, inherited a team with lots of returning players, senior leadership, and a Heisman hopeful in, Ryan, in Matt Ryan. Congratulations on not blowing it. It was tongue-in-cheek, but he was, in a way he was serious because he had all these things that was handed to him, and they said, good job not blowing it. What did the coach do? And really, the coach did it right. He stepped out of the way. Because he didn't get in the way of what was taking place with his football team. Nehemiah was also able to do that. He had gotten the right person into the job. He had established God's truth in the community. And third, he distinguished between the means and the end. The means and the end. Now listen to this. Nehemiah's job was a short-term job. And have you ever heard someone coach you to work yourself out of a job? That's what Nehemiah had to do. His job was to oversee the building of the protective wall. But beyond that wall, God had another mission and Nehemiah did not forget it. The people of God were to be separate from all the other nations. So this physical protection has taken place and now Nehemiah is reminding them, yes, there's something more and that is your, your, your heart. That is your spiritual side. Nehemiah made provision for the completion of God's full plan. It wasn't just the wall, but it was the wall and the people. He didn't make the completion of the wall the focal point. When they celebrated that day, it was a celebration of God's forgiveness among the people. It wasn't, look at me, let's have a parade. Nehemiah has rebuilt the wall. He didn't do that at all. He didn't blow the importance of that step out of proportion to this overall victory, because it was an overall victory for the people. He unselfishly resisted taking any form of an ego trip. Instead, he stepped aside and let others direct a far more important activity. Who was doing the directing? These priests, Ezra, namely, but the other religious leaders. And that activity was revival to the hearts of the people. Maria and her daughter Christina lived in a very poor neighborhood on the outskirts of a Brazilian village. Maria's husband had died when Christina was very young. She never remarried. Times were tough. And when Christina was old enough, she she moved out, or excuse me, she began to go out and look for work just to help her mom. Christina often spoke about going to the city. She dreamed of trading these dusty streets in her little village for the big and busy avenues, the exciting avenues of the city life. But just the thought of that horrified her mother. For her mother knew exactly what Christina would have to do for a living. And that's why her heart was was breaking when Christina spoke of it. That's why she couldn't believe it. When one morning she awoke and she went into Christina's room, the bed was empty, Christina had left. And mom knew exactly 
where her daughter was headed. So she quickly threw some clothes into a bag. She gathered up all her money and she ran out of the house. On her way to the bus stop, she entered a drugstore and, and, and got one last thing, photos. She went into one of those little booths and made just as many photos as she could. And with her purse full of those small black and white photos, she went to the bus station and on to Rio de Janeiro. When she got there, Maria knew that Christine had no way of earning money. She also knew that her daughter was too stubborn to give up and come home. What happens when pride meets hunger? What happens? A human being will do things that until that point were, were unthinkable. Knowing this, Maria began to search. She looked in bars. She looked in hotels. She looked in nightclubs. Any place where street walkers might be found. And she went to all of them. And in each of these places, Maria left her photo taped maybe to a bathroom mirror, tacked to the bulletin board in a hotel, fastened to the side of a telephone booth. And on the back of each of these photos, she had written a note. Then her money and her pictures ran out, and she left for home. A few weeks later, Christina descended the stairs in a rundown hotel. Her face looked drained. Her dreams had become a nightmare. But as she reached the bottom of the stairs, her eyes noticed a familiar face. She looked again, and there on the lobby mirror was that small black and white picture of her mother. Her eyes blurred and her throat tightened as she walked across the room and she removed the small photo. And written on the back was this compelling invitation. Whatever you've done, Whatever you become, it doesn't matter. Please come home. And she did. I think about that, that wonderful picture. And I think even now as we celebrate Christmas, how God in His perfect plan sent His Son to us. He came as a baby. He grew as a man. He grew in stature and wisdom and service to God as Father all the way to the cross. And, and Jesus, in His life, His death, He died on the cross for us, and then His resurrection has a message for us. And it's the same message that this mom shared with her daughter, Maria shared with Christina. Please come home. Please come home. Revival begins when we turn back to the Lord. Won't you turn to Him today? If you have never asked Jesus into your heart as Lord and Savior to forgive your sins, won't you do that today? Invite Him to come in and live within you. If you have already made that decision, but you're not walking strongly with the Lord, won't you come home to Him today? Won't you hear His invitation and respond? In just a moment, Ethan will be up here leading us in song. It's a time for you to respond right where you're standing, right at the altar to come and pray and kneel here, or to come and ask me, our brother Sam, to pray with you. We would love to do that. Salvation comes. We talked about this. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We have to ask Him. Forgive us of our sin. Take it away from us. Help us to live from this day forward. Won't you do that? Let's stand now and pray together. Lord, we are grateful for Your Word. We thank You for the opportunity to, to worship together today. And I pray to be challenged by You, by Your Spirit. And Lord, I pray even now, if You've led someone here to make a decision, give them courage to walk out from where they're standing this day, not to wait another day, but today to respond to the voice of the Lord. Lord, there may be some here who need to say yes to Jesus, who need to come to Him. There may be some who have wandered away from Jesus and they need to say yes to Your plans. Won't You do that today? Won't You be revived in spirit and ministry within Your life? Lord, I pray for the moving of Your Spirit now. May we each examine our hearts and respond to You and Your invitation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing together, I surrender all. Think about those words. I surrender all. Have you surrendered your all, your life to Jesus? Do that. In all to Jesus I surrender all. 
to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live and I surrender all and I surrender all and all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all and all to Jesus I surrender humbly at his feet I bow worldly pleasures all forsaken take me Jesus take me now and I surrender all and I surrender all and all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all and all to Jesus I surrender Lord I give myself to thee let me with thy hope and power let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all, and I surrender all, and all to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Do y'all want to sit down just a second? Or, yeah, just a second. I'm going to get, get Buzz up here. Come on up, Buzz. This is Buzz Ross. Do y'all know him? Yeah. All right, yeah. He comes, I was going to tease with y'all, he comes to make a $1 million donation to... (laughs) He Actually, what he's doing is even greater. We know that. He comes today just to to unite with the church family. He knows the Lord Jesus. He was baptized as a young man somewhere along the way. By his statement, all those in favor of receiving buzz in our fellowship indicate by saying amen. Amen. Of course, there are no others. And Miss Dalla, can we can we get Dalla to come up stand? Now y'all can clap for her too. Yeah. Sunday school teacher, our Urs, Urs, who wants to claim? I know, I know. Part, okay, look, I know there no fighting, but come on up. All right. Afterwards, please come by and welcome them into church fellowship. Now Buzz has wanted to make this decision for a while. But he was waiting on a special day, and the special day was when his neighbor, Mike Williams, had, who had has encouraged him so much, would be here together, and I think maybe that I would be here too. So anyway, my, I'm going to have Mike do our closing prayer together. When we, We're going to stand back up. Mike's going to close us in prayer, and then please come by to greet if you feel comfortable doing that. Let's stand together. Brother Mike, please close us in prayer.
Thank you, Mike. Amen. All right, you guys are dismissed.